Okay, thank Please. you. Thank, thank you, Ed. Um, looking at the audience, at least looking at those of you in the room, I'm guessing that you're not tax specialists. Um, you know, because tax specialists always wear suits. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's actually good news here, because if you, you're clearly interested in tax, and if you do want to find out about tax in Latin America, let me just reiterate what other people have said. This is a really good book, actually. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of good material, well analyzed, well digested. It's very authoritative. So I just genuinely recommend it for someone who wants to you know, get up to speed on the issues. And it's also, uh, at least from my perspective, the story it tells is at least a modest good news story. Uh, what's happened in the last 20 years or so in Latin America or Latin America and the Caribbean has involved some significant positive shifts, especially an overall increase in the uh, ratio of tax to GDP that has in turn funded social programs, many of that are going to poorer people. Um, as Vicente says, uh, there's plenty more to be done, but you know, it's not a bad start. What I'm going to do in a few minutes is be highly speculative and make some suggestions as to what might be some of the underlying politics behind this shift mm -hmm. with some suggestion about uh, what the implications are. Now, I'm not going to be at all original, and I'm, I have to uh, acknowledge um, Richard Byrd, who's the grand old man of taxation, the political economy of taxation, for very interesting conversations about these things, and I'm going to reflect to a large degree, things I've picked up from Richard. Let's start with the stere I mean, to talk about Latin America, you know, it's ridiculous in a way, but we're I'm going to carry on doing it, as everyone else has done. The stereotype of fiscal systems in Latin America, going back a few decades, really involved three or four elements. You have very unequal societies in terms of wealth and income, as people have said. And the fiscal systems, let's say, they had three key characteristics. Very low overall tax revenues. The, those taxes that were collected were very unfairly weighted on poorer people. Richer people didn't pay anything. And that patterns of public expenditure were not, as Francesca said, at all progressive. Um, rich people made sure that they got a very good share of the money, public money that was spent, especially money spent on tertiary education. So that's, the, if you like, that's a very crude stereotype of where we start from. Now, if you want to explain that and write about that as people did, you know, you can write about it purely in terms of the power of elites. You don't even need to have a state in your story, a state as a significant actor. The state is just this sort of rather empty box here which elites manipulate. What I want to suggest speculati speculatively <coughs> is that parts of these recent changes you've talked about do involve the state as becoming a significant fiscal poli political actor. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to call fiscal contracting. So how do we explain really that Tax collections as a percent of GDP have gone up and that public expenditures on poor people, especially targeted social programs, have also increased. Well, I suggest this is fiscal contracting and what I'm going to very briefly do is say what I think it, it involves. First, I'm going to assume that at some point at least, and not always, states do tend to have a significant institutional interest in raising and spending money you know, states like to raise and spend money. It makes it, leave, leaving aside the power of elites. They want revenue, they also want a fair degree of revenue certainty. But states also, being fairly smart, because they spend a lot of time raising revenue, realize that uh, while we use the term taxpayers and public expenditure, you know, there are many types of taxpayers and they pay different types of taxes. And there are many types of public expenditure and it goes to benefit many different types of people and that states are in a position sometimes to act as what the economists call discriminating monopolists. They're monopolists because they are the only people who tax, and they're discriminating because they can make choices about where they raise money from and where they spend it. And what they effectively do is they trade revenue for services. They know that if they provide more services to some people, all else being equal, 
those people are more likely to have a positive attitude and possibly pay taxes. And that has the sort of slightly odd implication that um, if, or perhaps not so odd implication, if you're providing services to people, you can actually tax them in return. Mm -hmm. But not the people en masse, but particular groups of people. Now, some interesting research was done by Jeffrey Timmons some years ago, based on cross-national <coughs> statistical analysis, challengeable, but nevertheless interesting. And he looked at patterns of taxation and uh, patterns of public expenditure in a large number of countries cross-section the and time series. And his results suggested that in countries where governments actually <coughs> spend a lot of money on the kind of things we want them to spend money on, the kind of things that tend to result in high levels of human development, that you have an unusually high proportion of regressive taxes as a percentage of GDP. Regressive, not progressive. You have progressive spending and regressive taxes. Mm -hmm. Conversely, he claims to show that countries that seem to protect property rights relatively heavily tend to have high proportion of progressive taxes in GDP. And what he argues, and I think it's quite plausible, is that where large masses of the population are benefiting from public expenditure on health, education, targeted transfers, etc., they are taxable through things like personal income taxes and, uh, and re even relatively regressive VAT. Um, where you have elites that are benefiting from the protection of property rights and the other things elites want, they are actually willing to pay taxes on income in particular. Maybe not even wealth very often, but certainly income. Now, what might have been happening in Latin America over the last uh, few years and decades as we've had have this gradual shift is that we are getting the development of exactly this kind of fiscal contracting, which is very much like the OECD fiscal mm -hmm. contracting. Um, elites are getting something. They're getting more protection of property rights, and the mass of the population are getting targeted social spending. Now, the implication of that, and I'm simply going to conclude, because this is speculation, I can't prove this, is that those of us who would like to see much more equality in the tax burden in Latin America probably will be disappointed. Um, because if, if the sort of simple political economy model that I just outlined to you is the one that's working and likely to work in future, it's not going to be progressive taxation that's actually going to fund social spending. It's going to be the extension of personal, ad, uh, personal income tax and it's going to be the possible extension, as, as you show, very well show, Vicente, an already actually rather efficient set of VAT systems. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm suggesting is this is a good news story, but I'm not sure it's going to be converted even to, into an even better news story of the way we would like in, in the very short run. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very rich and stimulating set of discussant comments.